Okay, you think we're good to start? Oh, sorry. Yes, indeed. I think we're fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Welcome. Kind of it. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us here on our third day of a virtual Environmental Congress for our 49th annual Environmental Congress. We have our in-person session tomorrow at Mercer County Community College and Commissioner, DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette will be kicking us off at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. So we do hope that you will be able to join us in person. My name is Jennifer Coffey. I am the Executive Director of ANJAC and it's a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I'd like to take a moment and thank all of our sponsors for making this Environmental Congress happen. Without them, we would not be able to bring you these presentations, certainly not at the cost that we are bringing them to you. And we appreciate many of our sponsors who are speaking at this year's event and sharing with us the work that they are doing um, on our coastline, on our inlands, in relationship to climate change and um, converting our electricity and energy grids and protecting our waters and bringing us clean water. So thank you to our sponsors. I also wanna thank you as environmental commissioners who are here with us today and other local elected officials. ANJAC's first and um, most important priority is to help you. So to help you in whatever challenges and what other aspirations you have for your community, we are here as your resource to provide advice, to provide technical support, to provide small grants, and to provide publications and continuing education. Given that in New Jersey, we address every environmental issue under the sun, in order to bring you the best programming and the most focused programming, ANJAC looks at our work through several lenses. The first are the impacts of the climate crisis. Both drought and flood are the most uh, pressing way that we are experiencing the climate crisis here in New Jersey, both of which we have seen this summer. So we will continue to bring programming to you, advice and work on policies that enhance New Jersey's resilience, as well as to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to keep the problem of the climate crisis from growing exponentially worse. We are also looking at all of our work, everything we do, our programming, our publications, our invited speakers through the lens of advancing environmental justice. And we're working to create a more equitable and just New Jersey and to elevate the voices of overburdened communities, environmental justice communities to the municipal level, to um, the state policy level and doing what we can to use our resources to, to elevate those voices. We are also looking at the intersectionality of environmental issues such as plastic pollution. And we know we've done an awful lot of good on ending plastic pollution in New Jersey and there's so very much more to do. We focus on plastic as one of our intersectional issues because we know that it sits at the nexus of climate crisis because plastics are fossil fuels, at environmental justice because the way those plastics are made and the way they are burned at end of life are a huge environmental justice issue. And certainly plastics are one of our most pressing water pollution issues. So again, we thank you for working on all of these issues at the community level and being here with us today. To that extent, I am proud to announce that ANJAC's board voted last month to alter our mission statement to affirm the work that we have been doing and reassure the commitment that we have to our work in the future. So our mission now reads, the mission of ANJAC is to promote local action to protect and restore New Jersey's natural resources and to ensure healthy communities for today and the future. ANJAC advances its mission by engaging in equitable and inclusive practices through leadership, partnerships, education, advocacy for strong public policy and in support of environmental commissions, public officials, and communities throughout New Jersey. So I wanna thank you again for everything you do for your communities and for the environment. I also wanna thank you for your support. I know many of you are also financial supporters of ANJAC and without you, we could not bring you the programming and publications that we do, ranging from our fundamentals for environmental commissioners, which I call EC Boot Camp every spring. Uh, so we look forward to seeing many of you in February and March for that to our environmental Congress, 
and the issues that we hear from you throughout the year as we try to bring you programming that meets your needs and give you articles and support in ANJAC Report, ANJAC News, et cetera. So as you are thinking about your end of your giving, we ask that you please keep us in mind. We'd also ask if you are able, if you would consider an additional donation to ANJAC this week as we bring you our Environmental Congress programming. And we'd also like to remind you that we have less than four weeks now until the election. ANJAC is a 501c3 nonprofit, so we do not endorse anybody running for election, whether it's dog catcher all the way up to president, but we do encourage you to exercise your voice and vote for candidates that most closely align with your values. So voter registration deadline is next week, the 18th. So if you're not registered, if you've recently moved, make sure your registration is up to date. Early voting in New Jersey starts October 29th, so you can get it in before Halloween, get your vote counted. And November uh, 1st for mail-in ballot uh, applications, and then the big day is on November 8th. If you have any questions about registering to vote or where to vote, there's a great state website at nj.gov backslash state backslash elections backslash vote. And so just a few housekeeping notes before I introduce our speakers today. We would like to ask you to please type any questions that you have for our speakers in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. We'll monitor those questions and if we can answer them quickly, we will do so. Yes, this is being recorded and yes, we will send the link out to everyone who has registered for Environmental Congress. If you're having technical difficulty, then go ahead and call our deputy director, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ritter, and there's her number there. We've all done a million Zooms by now, so I'm sure we're all good. And these sessions will also be posted on ANJAC's YouTube channel at ANJAC Views. And so with that, I would like to thank both Liz and Julie uh, Groth from ANJAC staff are here today to assist with Q&A and some tech support. And we have three wonderful speakers with us today. We have Doug O'Malley, Peter Friedman, and uh, Yvette Jesus. I did not get that right. <laughs> Tell me your last name again. I even wrote it out phonetically. It's Viasus. Viasus. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Very I will good. commit to getting that right. Viasus. So names are important. First, we are going to have Doug and I'm going to introduce Doug and then I'll introduce Peter and Yvette as they come to us with their presentations. So Doug is the Director of Environment New Jersey and Environment New Jersey Research and Policy Center. Doug has worked for multiple issues, uh, including campaigns to fast track New Jersey's clean energy economy via offshore wind, solar and energy efficiency programs, adopt and expand New Jersey's clean car program and get more electric vehicles on our roads and keep New Jersey in the Reggie Climate Pollutant Program. He's led campaigns to oppose new fossil fuel infrastructure across the state and in the Delaware River watershed, protect New Jersey's drinking water and watershed lands through increased anti-degradation protections and fought attempts to weaken protections for the highlands and the pinelands. Doug served on the board uh, or serves on the board of New Jersey Work Environment Council, Environment Endowment of New Jersey, Environment America Incorporated and received an EPA Environmental Quality Award in 2012. He also serves as the president of Charge EBC, an electric vehicle coalition, and serves as the treasurer of the New Jersey Working Families Alliance. He served as the director for the last decade and worked with the organization in Trenton since 2001 when he graduated from Harvard with a history degree. Doug, it's a pleasure as always to work with you. I'm thrilled to have you here with us this morning, this evening, this afternoon, if I get the time of day right. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to you. You should be able to share your screen and then we'll tune in to what you have to tell us. Okay, it's loading, give it a second. Wonderful, thank you, Doug. Super. Thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you to Julie and Liz and everyone on the ANJEC team for you know making the Congress possible, right? And, and now we're kind of, you know, we're still in the pandemic, but we've been able to kind of reconvene. And so I, I really appreciate the effort to kind of make 
um, you know, make this process of the Congress hybrid um, and have it be kind of a rolling thunder approach all throughout this week. Um, I know I, I can't see obviously all, all of you on the other side of the screen. I know there's a lot of friendly faces um, that have been part of ANJAC and the Congress for years and years and years. And, and then obviously some, some new uh, faces and names as well. Um, and that's part of the reason I'm kind of so excited to, to join uh, my fellow uh, panelists, uh, Peter and Yvette, because there is so much to talk about uh, with the transition on electric vehicles and the transition for our energy grid. And I think, um, you know, what what I'm hoping to do just over these next 20 minutes is just to give, uh, you know, a little bit of slice of where we are, right, where we've come from, and then where we're going. And then obviously, um, you know, it's easy to kind of imagine, uh, you know, imagine a world where we actually are now electrifying our transportation sector. We are in a position to be able to transition off fossil fuels. We are in a position to think about uh, a climate future that actually is climate friendly. Um, we're not there yet, but if we think of about the last decade, we've come a long way. So I just wanted to um, to start off with the, those thanks for for Anjek and and uh, and honestly for all of you that are doing the work at the local level. Um, we'll hear more from Peter on this to make it easier to not just go green but to transition our, our uh, transportation choices. Um, I also just wanted to thank the ongoing work of not only our allies in the state environmental. Uh, community and movement, uh, but also the work of Charge EVC, which is a, a broad coalition of electric vehicle uh, advocates and interests and, and businesses, as well as the work of the New Jersey Electric Vehicle Association, uh, which I think one of the most powerful things about EVs is that we have plenty of evangelists, and they are literally every single EV driver. Um, so let me just start by talking about why this is so important, because I think when we think about EVs and we think about the experience it very quickly becomes a question of logistics and how do we get more cars on the road? What's the experience? Um, how fast do they go? And I just wanted to start off just with a kind of simple reminder of, you know, this, this is, there's many reasons why electric vehicles are important. This is a big one. Um, and this is a, a picture from, from last fall, uh, obviously out in, uh, in California, in the Bay area, the golden, uh, the golden gate Br uh, bridge. Um, uh, you know, that's just a reminder of how, or excuse me, uh, the Bidwell Bar Bridge looks like the Golden Gate. You know, hopefully uh, the Bay Area got a ton of that smoke. But this is just a reminder of what kind of the wildfires out West look like and feel like. And and uh, we in New Jersey have gotten that that air pollution. Um, I think all of us remember last summer, you know, the haze that came from the West. We didn't see that as much this summer, but those climate impacts are here. We are obviously facing them in real time. Um, I don't want to kind of belabor, um, you know, the kind of the basic science that all of us know, but I, I think this is just a reminder, right? The debate is over. It's just a question of how much we're going to see carbon dioxide rise, right? So we are, you know, getting close to 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, that ho infamous hockey stick um, that's leading to all sorts of climate impacts. And I'll, I'll kind of end my presentation by by talking about that as well, because this is, I think, the important thing for us to re remind ourselves, you know, there are real climate impacts. And the largest source of emissions, of course, does come from our transportation sector. Um, I will say the thing that's probably most different right now when we're talking about electric vehicles is that, you know, in a previous generation, we would talk about the Chevy Volt. Uh, we talk about the Nissan Leaf. Um, you know, and, and for many, um, for many years, people would kind of think of EVs as basically like a souped up Prius. There was less selection, there were less options. Um, the choices generally were, you know, much more expensive than your traditional uh, internal combustion uh, slash gas powered vehicle. Uh, now we're at a point where every major automaker has EVs. We're seeing rollouts of electric Mustang. This is, a, you know, the Ford uh, Lightning. Um, you know, now suddenly the, the various options, depending on kind of what cars you like, you can find them in an electrified version. And that I think is starting to kind of change the conversation that EVs aren't just for one type of car buyer. They're not just for, um, you know, people with, uh, you know, with kids or without kids or old people or young people, you know, we are kind of turning the conversation of, of who an EV is, is for. Um, and that's, that's definitely a big one. Um, there's actually a great, we're not gonna, I'm not going to play these videos, but there's a great set of videos called Busting Electric Vehicle Myths run um, by 
um, uh, Plug in America. Um, you can quickly Google that. That I think is is kind of a great. And one of the myths is that EVs are just you know it's just a Nissan Leaf or it's just a Chevy uh, Bolt. That's changing, and that that's big because that obviously reflects the fact the car market needs to be diverse and EVs need to be diverse as well. Um, just what I was referencing before, you know, transportation is you know this has been true certainly for a long time. It has gotten worse over time. Um, especially as elect, our, we've started to green our electric sector to some degree, uh, emissions from the electric sector have come down. That's always been true in New Jersey, and I will get to that in a moment. But this is just a reminder that, you know, five years ago, 30% of our emissions were coming from transportation. That is continuing to increase. And we would certainly have a world now where, you know, we are past the worst parts of the pandemic. We have seen car traffic, even in 2020, even in 2020, rebound very quickly. We have not seen public transit rebound as much, um, and that's that's a huge issue because obviously the cars and trucks we drive are the largest source of transportation emissions. In New Jersey, it's 42 percent, right? And so this is where nationally it's 30 percent. Jersey, it's more than 40. That's that that's a real problem. And so when we kind of think about the vulnerability of our state. Uh, coastal flooding, inland flooding. Um, we need to kind of, you know, we obviously, um, and Anjak has been doing a lot of work on this as well. We need stronger flood rules, of course, but we also need to be not just adapting. We, we need to be more than just resilient. We need to be mitigating our climate emissions. And that's where the transportation sector comes in as our largest source, as, uh, you know, as uh, Willie Sutton famously said, if you want to rob banks, if you want to money, you rob banks. If you want to reduce carbon emissions, you need to decarbonize the transportation sector. Um, and this is also where we've seen just massive improvement in the amount of EV registration. So in, a, in an era a decade ago, and I remember doing an event where we literally, you could almost literally count the number of people in the EV groups, um, you know, the, it was a club. And of course, you know, for a broader transition, we can't have it be a club. We have seen the registration numbers really start to increase in 2018. And the um, even, um, you know, with supply chain issues, 2021 was far and away um, the best year for EV registrations. I'll talk about this later. You know, this, we need to see exponential growth. So it's great that we had those number of EVs sold in uh, 21. That number needs to continue to increase exponentially uh, in 20, throughout this year, 22, 23, 24 we are going to see a, a, a market shift. And, and this also gets to the point of what's the tipping point in for EVs. And if you look at, at the transition in some of kind of a European countries like Norway, usually the transition point is about 5% um, of uh, EVs that are sold. We are right at that point right now. That doesn't mean that we can kind of clap, <laughs> give ourselves a clap and a, and a pat in the back. Um, there's a, a lot more work that needs to happen, especially with our infrastructure. But it does mean that we are getting closer to that tipping point and starting to see more exponential growth. Um, I just want to talk a moment about the sustainability of EVs, because this is always where I think there's a, there's a question, right? Are EVs really greener? Uh, you know, the far and away answer is yes, they are. Um, there's no kind of free lunch um, in, in any kind of life cycle analysis. But when we look at the cost of fossil fuel vehicles and the cost of internal combustion engines, um, you know, having that no tailpipe emissions coming out is priceless. And you're looking at an average 80% reduction emissions for EVs across the state. A lot of that depends on the grid. It depends on when you're, you're charging, um, you know, which of course gets the fact that this is holistic. So, you know, Yvette will talk about this later about the importance of greening the grid. The two need to come, the, need, the two need to be paired here. And so this is why I especially love this graphic because it's showing EV charging over a solar canopy. That's the sort of thing we, we need this to become commonplace um, and to make sure that we're greening our grid, we're strengthening it, um, to make it more resilient with storage. And then we're also providing more uh, infrastructure to actually charge uh, beyond just the home, although that's the easiest place for many uh, single family homeowners. Um, this is just a little bit more of a breakdown on the emissions per per vehicle, and, and this just kind of shows, you know, if you if you can go hybrid, that's good. If you can go plug in, that's good. All electric is obviously undoubtedly um, cleaner, um, and this also just shows the the various electric sources 
um, you know, the more we can kind of green, um, you know, the, the grid and you'll see solar is still a very small part of our electric sector. You know, wind is the smallest part of our electric sector. New Jersey has, uh, as part of the 2018 Clean Energy Act, a mandate um, to provide 50% of our energy from renewable sources by 2030. That obviously um, is what we need to have a greener grid. And so EV charging will get better and EVs will get cleaner over the course of this decade as we green the grid. And so that's something that obviously will never happen with an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, I just wanted to kind of emphasize this too, because there is there are life cycle costs and you'll certainly hear, um, you know, I, I don't want to say the haters, but, it, you know, you will kind of have um, the reply guys say, well, what about, and we'll, we'll get into this. What about the battery? What about the life cycle of the battery? What does, what are the impacts, um, you know, of charging overnight? And, and this is just a kind of another breakdown here of what, you know, what the life cycle um, carbon um, impacts are, right? And obviously battery, batteries for EVs do have an impact. Um, obviously the producing the vehicle itself has an impact just like an internal combustion engine. Um, there are upstream um, impacts, and that really depends upon the source of energy you're using. So you can kind of see the difference between California and Texas, right? That's a big difference. That that's based on the grid. Um, we're obviously a little cleaner in the Northeast as well. Um, our electric grid, the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland grid, which stretches all the way to Illinois, that is a that that is a um, you know ongoing effort to kind of green PJM. Uh, but this just shows, again, that as we green our in-state energy and as we green our electric grid, the potential for EVs to be beating gas is just far, you know, far and away. So that, you know, the the um, the bar graph on the very left-hand side of your screen, you know, that's what we want to focus at, on, right? An EV that has a 300-mile range um, that is on the U.S. average grid um, is much, much cleaner than uh, the internal combustion engine. All right, let's keep going here. Um, so let me just kind of talk, you know, th this is kind of more broadly on a kind of climate emissions, but let me just talk about the health impacts of our, our current transportation cycle, our current transportation system. And the reason I, I, I want to do this is because this is just kind of so much assumed that we can't really conceptualize a world where we are eliminating emissions from our transportation sector. But I say that, and we did that for a very small period in the height of the pandemic and true lockdown, the air quality in New Jersey was drastically better in, especially in late March, April, and early May. And it was so much better that you could literally smell the difference. You could see the difference. And that's obviously the world we want to get back to. You know, obviously there's, there's more to our, towards green air transportation sector than just promoting EVs. Um, but if we think about air quality, and I, I apologize because the, the numbers are pretty small here, but these are the number of days this is pre-pandemic in 2018 when half or more of uh, the monitoring stations reported elevated levels uh, of uh, various uh, ozone pollutants. And if you look at uh, these numbers, the broader metropolitan area for Newark, uh, as well as Jersey City and New York at 32 days, uh, South Jersey, especially um, in the broader Camden, Philadelphia, Wilmington at 43. Um, Trenton, right, which, um, you know, had even a higher number, which I think is uh, kind of a reminder that air pollution uh, isn't just in dense central, uh, isn't just in cities, right? It's also in some of our kind of more uh, suburban and even rural communities. And the reminder here, of course, is that air pollution has a huge cost uh, of public health. It has mortality costs. We have 600,000. Uh, folks in the state who suffer from asthma, 160,000 kids. Um, that's that's the cost and that's the tax of gasoline cars that we are paying each and every day. And that's especially true in our cities that are already overburdened with air pollution. Uh, our environmental justice communities uh, face the kind of the brunt of this silent tax on their lungs. And that that's a reminder of the importance of this transition. Um, and also the fact that the electrification or transportation sector means many things. It, EVs are in, and when I say EVs specifically, um, light duty vehicles, uh, trucks and cars, that's the, that is the largest population on the road. But there are a ton of other vehicles, obviously, uh, medium and heavy duty trucks are huge, our transit buses, um, school buses, 
uh, and and something that doesn't really exist right now, but will soon, mobility options, primarily through electric vehicles to provide essentially uh, car sharing uh, and ride sharing options for people that don't have a car and don't want a car. And so this is kind of a reminder that we are very focused, or at least I am in this presentation on light duty electric vehicles, but the electrification process we need to see, you know, isn't just on light duty. Um, and obviously the health impacts obviously affect, um, you know, all of us, but especially in our overburdened environmental justice communities. All right, I'm going to um, keep going here and kind of move to a little bit of the news you can use, right? And so this starts, to, and Peter will kind of talk about this. Um, we want to provide a network of EV charging around the state um, that is comprehensive. And, and really, when we think of what is comprehensive, it means you do not need to search for an EV charger. You know where one is in your community. You don't even need to kind of put it into, uh, you know, PlugShare or some other app on your phone. Uh, they should be as common as 7-Eleven and gas stations. We certainly are not there yet. Uh, we have, over the course of the last four or five years, we've increased the number of EV, EVs on the road significantly. The charging infrastructure has not caught up yet. And so this is why I'm really excited to hear from, from Peter, uh, because there are some towns that are leading the way, but we want to see a broader investment from, um, from the state to have more charging infrastructure around New Jersey, because there are obviously a ton of people that don't have a single family home, whether you're renting or whether you're in an apartment building or, or multifamily, um, there's a lot of people that don't kind of have this quote unquote luxury. Um, that being said, there's a lot of people in sing single family homes in the state and the ability to charge your car at home. You know, when we say you never have to go to a gas station again, you, to some degree, you almost don't even need to go to an EV charger outside of your house. Uh, because, you know, the ability, even at level one, even you're using your standard 120 volt outlet, uh, generally is going to be okay for most people. Like if you charge overnight on uh, level one, and if you're not, um, you know, you don't have a significant commuting distance, that'll actually work. We recommend that people get level two, you, you bump up to 240. Um, essentially, it's like a dryer, except it's your car. It takes anywhere from four to eight hours to fully charge. Um, they can be had for, you know, it can be more than $700, but certainly there's kind of a, a range of options. Um, and then, of course, the level three chargers. This is not necessarily what you need for the house, but this is what we want to see um, at high, you know, high traffic roadways. So not just the turnpike and the parkway, although finally we're starting to get kind of that infrastructure there, but basically any kind of high traffic area where you might need to go to a gas station. Or in this case, you might need a, a quick top off. The technology and the charging time keeps on getting better, so it can be as fast as 15 minutes. We expect that, that get even faster in the future. The cost is still, um, you know, high for level three chargers. But this is again, any new technology uh, needs time to roll out, um, and also this is where we want to take away that range anxiety. That's one of the myths that exists um, because people say, "Oh, I don't want to get an EV because I don't have a place to charge." Well, yes, but most charging can happen at home. And for those of us that can't charge at home, there, there are places to charge out and about. Uh, we want to obviously make it easier. That's why we want workplace charging um, as well. Um, so let's go, keep going here. This is just some examples. And I think it's kind of cool. You can literally go to Amazon, buy your home charger, right? So this is not, um, you know, this, this should be commonplace. You should be able to go to uh, ultimately Lowe's and Home Depot and, and find this as well. But this is just a reminder of kind of how far we've come in the last decade. Um, I also just wanted to talk briefly just on the savings of owning an EV, because this is probably beyond range anxiety. This is obviously the, the biggest argument we run into is I can't afford an EV. And in many ways, the sticker uh, price, and we'll get into a moment how the sticker price gets way down uh, once you use rebates. The sticker price is still obviously more expensive than a gas powered car. But this is kind of where you really kind of need to do the homework you know, before you go into any dealership, you say, how much does it cost to own and operate a car? What are the costs of oil changes? What are the costs of maintenance? What are the costs of repairs over time? Because obviously, uh, you know, basically an internal combustion engine is just an engine that's exploding all the time. It's going to break down. It's going to, it's, it's going to need repair. That's one of, a, one of the reasons EV drivers are just so hugely uh, satisfied with their vehicles is because they don't require as much maintenance costs. So uh, again, this is kind of a breakdown based on the type of car um, on, on hybrids versus EVs. Um, the cost per mile um, is, 
uh, you know, it, it, uh, over time for EVs is a lot less. This is kind of harder to do. You're not going to break out your calculator at the dealership, but you know, this is why there are opportunities to um, have um, have this breakdown to think long and hard about what you're actually paying for, not only in the dealership, but week by week when you go to the gas pump, and especially this summer was kind of a wake up call of, hey, gas might not be three dollars forever, right? There, there is a future where gas we, we will see spikes again. Uh, we're continuing to see those spikes. Um, so let me just kind of end by quickly talking just on, on same, some state policy before I turn it um, over to, to, to Peter. Um, our EV law, and this is hugely important, right? Because there's a reason why there are more EVs available in New Jersey. We are part of the California Clean Cars Program that was attacked during the Trump era. Um, we've been part of that for close to 20 years now. That is a, a, exactly what we need. We need state policy, in this case, a national policy. There's more than uh, 16 states that are part of the California Clean Cars Program that's pushing um, policy, that's pushing automakers to produce cleaner cars. And as part of the law that Governor Murphy signed nearly three years ago, there's a mandate to have more than 300,000 EVs on the road by the end of 2025. We are not kind of on track to hit that goal right now, and that's why it's, it's hugely important that we get more commitment from the administration to make investments in infrastructure for charging, um, as well as to expand uh, EV rebates, uh, because it, you know we you, it's harder to catch up when you're falling behind. We are also on the ideally on the cusp of having New Jersey join um, the next step of the Clean Cars Program, which is looking uh, over the course of the next decade plus uh, to you know really phase out the sale. Of gas power cars, and this this is I think a critical moment because we're going to see gas power cars be on our roads for the next three decades. That being said, we need to start to move to an era where we are not selling new gas power cars. That's what California proposed at the end of August. A number of states, including our neighbors New York and Massachusetts, are working to adopt those rules. The state has committed to this previously, um, but it needs to kind of do more than submit a, a one-liner in a climate report on it. We need to adopt that policy. And we need to be making the investments to uh, be looking at a, a future where we where the, the default is buying an EV, right? And that's, and that's ultimately kind of shifting the expectation um, and also making sure that we're providing, providing opportunities for consumers to be able to purchase an EV and have a place to plug it in. Um, I'm not going to run through all, all these policies, but this is a reminder of, of the kind of the framework that the EV law provided. Um, I wanted to talk briefly uh, before I wrap up just on uh, the level of, of rebates and kind of where that is. Uh, we've seen uh, the rebate program evolve over the course of the last two and a half years. It's been wildly successful. Um, and in some ways, this is exactly what we want to see. We want to see a rebate program that is creating uh, you know, a, a rush to buy an EV. Now, obviously, the EV program rolled out right on the cusp of the pandemic. Um, we're still kind of in the pandemic um, from a supply chain perspective, um, certainly a public health perspective as well. Um, the rebate has been slightly reduced. It's a $4,000 rebate um, that's focused on kind of the most affordable sector of, of the EV market from forty to 45000 It uh, phase The rebate phases down to 2000 um, from uh, $2,000 from EVs that are in the $45,000 to $55,000 uh, range. The big news, of course, is the Inflation Reduction Act, which has passed uh, just this August, is really bringing back uh, the federal tax credit. The federal tax credit is phased out for a number of uh, manufacturers, most prominently uh, GM and Tesla. Um, this is also kind of promoting uh, manufacture of battery components in this country, which is kind of a you know win-win for the green economy. Um, not every manufacturer is going to be able to immediately bring back the rebate. Um, uh, GM supposedly is going to be is in a position to do that. Tesla is working to do that. A number of other automakers will need essentially the next uh, two to three years to kind of ramp that up. Um, so you you still have the federal tax credit to some extent, depending on the car you're looking at. You have the the federal uh, the state rebate. You also aren't paying sales tax, which is certainly significant. Um, and then. Uh, there also are credits and rebates for the installation of home charging, both at the state level, a direct uh, $250 rebate, and then a 30% federal rebate as well. So you, there's kind of there's incentives beyond just the experience of driving an EV that are important. 
Um, and I just wanted to, to kind of end here, and there are a number of questions, but I want to give time to my other panelists, um, just by reminding ourselves, right, climate change is not, is not going away. We, we haven't had Ida, but we did have Ian. And, you know, for all of us kind of looking at Fort Myers, uh, you know, I, my immediate thought is, you know, they, they did not duck that bullet. We ultimately will not duck a bullet too. We will see more extreme weather events, whether it be Sandy or Ida, New Jersey. And if we're serious about it, we need to electrify our transportation sector. Um, and then this is just a the last reminder, right? What happens out West doesn't stay out West. Um, and so th this again is why we need to be making this transition and we need to be doing it not just at the state level, but we need to be doing it at the county and local level. And that's why I'm just putting up my contact information right here and some of our information. But you know, this is why it's so important to have local leadership uh, be leading the way. So let me turn it back to you, Jen, and um, so we can kind of hear next uh, from some local examples. Wonderful, thank you, Doug. Really appreciate all that great information. And so I am going to introduce our next speaker. We're going to hold Q&A until the very end, and then we should have some time for that. Now we have Peter Friedman from Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee and Climate Action Committee. Peter has lived in Madison for 43 years and is a member of the Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee, Madison's Climate Action Pilot Program, and the Climate Action Work Group of North Jersey Sustainable Municipal Alliance. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin and then spent his career at Bell Labs and General Dynamics in various positions in systems engineering, acoustics and signal processing, fiber optics and program management. Since retiring in 2013, he has taught physics at New York University and Drew University. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, this afternoon. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, Doug, you have to stop sharing your screen first. Oh, and, yep, let me uh, fix then that. Then we can have Dr. Friedman uh, share his. Mm. All right. Wonderful. There. And you're on mute, so we can't hear you, Peter. I'm, I'm off there mute. There you now. go. Now you hear me, okay? Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, uh, I'm Peter Fried. I live in Madison, as, as uh, Jennifer said. I want to thank Jennifer, Julie, Liz, and all of ANJAC for setting this up. And I think uh, this is a very valuable session uh, because our communities need to. Uh, React to the to um, to the growth in EVs, which we all hope is um, uh, coming. And Doug, I want to thank you for setting the stage beautifully um, and giving us a, a very good um, summary of, of the, the the national and state situation. Um, my purpose here is to talk about a local example of local action um, in Madison, New Jersey, um, and uh, in order to not take up um, too much of people's time. Uh, I will go and share my first slide and start right in on the material. Uh, let me share and see if that works. Uh, where are we? We're over here. It's coming and, in right now. Okay. And there I we go. We've got it. If you could just put it that. in presentation mode. Perfect. And Thank you here. so much. Okay. Um, so we call ourselves the Rose City. That's why you'll see a lot of roses. Um, associated with, uh, with Madison. Um, so Madison is uh, basically a typical uh, suburban uh, North Jersey bedroom community. We're on the rail line. Uh, population is about 16,000 people, um, about 6,000 electric meters, because that's the kind of thing we're gonna be talking about today. And for those who uh, want some technical information, our total electrical consumption for the town um, in a year is about 130 uh, gigawatt hours. Um, now, um, what makes Madison unique is that we're one of uh, only nine towns, I believe, in New Jersey um, that has its own uh, electric utility. And um, before I go into the pluses and minuses in detail, uh, I'll, I'll say that may make some of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, either easier or harder in other towns. But um, I'm very happy living here and pursuing the things I'm interested in, like 
figuring out how to get a, um, you know, lowering our emissions. And um, among the pluses that we have here in Madison is um, that we buy our own power through the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland network that Doug talked about. Um, there's a consortium of the nine towns with their own municipal utilities that, that buys, buys our own power. Um, and uh, over the last few years, our power has been even cleaner than the New Jersey average. And that I think has been an accident. Uh, I don't know the details, but um, the advertised reason for how we buy our power is simply on cost. And um, uh, we have pretty clean power um, on our local grid. That doesn't mean that the cost equation might not change in a year or two, and maybe in the future, we uh, actually might get closer to the Jersey average, but we all have to lower that. And Doug talked about um, how that's gonna happen going forward. Our um, electric rates, as far as I know, are pretty average for Morris County. And uh, again, we just pay our electric bill to the town. The town maintains um, our internal grid uh, and distributes electricity to us. Uh, we're very proud and uh, I hope I don't uh, tempt the fates by saying this, we have an excellent outage and reliability record. Um, outages are short and infrequent and the town does a very good job of um, uh, you know, taking care of tree limbs and things like that. Uh, in addition, you know, it provides a very small administrative overhead so that if we want to try something with regard to changing rates or changing some facilities someplace, the administrative overhead of doing that is, is very small by the nature of having a small utility. So um, I would not tell too many people in our utility this this statement, but I, I consider it as sort of a laboratory for, for trying out good ideas and trying out new things. And um, I think it, it's really working out that way. Um, and we, we feel pretty fortunate living here. Um, on the flip side, uh, there are a couple of negatives in that we are a small utility and we don't have buildings full of computers and analysts to track our, um, you know, track a, a thousand different metrics of our performance on a continuing basis. Um, and um, we have to usually contract out for um, deep analytics on our grid and things like that. And I'll talk more about that in, a, in two slides or so. Um, in addition, because we are a municipal utility, we do not have access to some of the BPU benefit programs uh, some of that is changing as the BPU has shifted some of those benefit programs over to the utilities themselves. Uh, but in the past, there have been some BPU um, incentives for energy efficiency and other things that, that we don't have access to. Um, what I'd like to do today is basically uh, on one slide, uh, busy slides, I apologize in advance, um, talk about uh, what we've done over the last two years, basically to foster EV growth in town. Um, then on two slides, uh, talk about the things we're engaged in right now um, with regard to clean power on our grid. And then finally end up by talking about our concerns for the future and um, what we might be doing about some of those things. Um, so as I said, over the last two years, we've been trying to encourage EV growth in town. And before I even put up the first bullets here, um, what really prompted this early on? What you need is you need an angel. We had one volunteer who was very passionate about this, who pestered the town fathers and helped them. He got involved, he showed them where they needed EV chargers. He helped them write grants for, um, uh, to fund these EV chargers. And he, um, he was, you know, he stayed with it and kept on um, bugging people and developed partnerships with the town government. And um, the result is that we now have uh, 10 dual port level two stations. Uh, so basically 20 public 
charging cables uh, at uh, various locations in town. Um, the purchase of these was all funded by the state. Uh, it pays to plug in program. We did five of these in 2020 and five of these in 2021. Um, the installation and figuring out where they go was low, was, was simple because it was our uh, own electric utility that did the installations. Um, figuring out where they go was a matter of a few people in a few offices at our town hall working together on uh, where we wanted to put these and uh, where they would be uh, most suitable. Um, we are, I think, um, at the uh, forefront of installing these public stations uh, in our town. And therefore, as expected, the usage is low. We track the usage. You can see that on the upper right. Um, and um, I'm not going to go into the, the details of, of, the, of each charging station, but uh, those numbers will hopefully go up in the future. Uh, our main motivation for installing public chargers was to encourage people to visit Madison businesses, Madison stores, and Madison restaurants, and uh, use these things at, uh, at various Madison activities. So it's sort of a different set of people than the home charging, um, which Doug talked about, and I'll talk about uh, some more in some slides coming up. Uh, with these, we instituted uh, an EV information page um, on the town web, and um, we have an application in um, for a level three charger, and we know where we will put it if, uh, if the grant money is approved um, so that we can buy one of these, which as Doug said, is more expensive than the level two uh, charger. Um, in addition to that, every year, we have in Madison, as pictured on the middle, on the right over here, if you can see my cursor, a, an EV Expo. We've done two of these, and we'll do it again uh, next April, presumably, where we get dealers to bring current EV models into town. And uh, we have a public event where people can come and talk to the dealers about these EVs. And uh, it's been very successful. We've had a lot of excellent uh, public participation and the dealers too were very happy um, doing this. So I would encourage people to do that. It's uh, been copied by a number of area towns so that uh, there are many such events and the, um, the associations, the EV associations that Doug mentioned earlier uh, will tell you where these events are. Our police department, uh, is currently using four hybrid cruisers. They've ordered two more. Uh, they've just taken delivery um, as shown proudly um, with um, our police captain uh, in my driveway with uh, the recently received Chevy Bolt that we'll be using for a parking patrol. And um, a funny story is they got the first two hybrid cruisers and um, drove it over to my house and said, you want to get a ride? And I said, great. And they took me out for a nice ride. And I said, but it doesn't say hybrid on the side. And I got very upset at them uh, because one of the big things about these, of course, is the messaging. And um, so now on this hybrid, uh, on this electric uh, bolt over here, which is all white and is being dressed for the police department, uh, probably as we speak, they said they're going to put a big electric plug on the side of the, uh, on the side of the bolt to make sure people know that it's, uh, it's an EV. Um, and um, Doug talked about statewide goals for EV population that are now in the electric vehicle law. Um, we asked at the beginning of this process, what does this mean for Madison? What does this mean for any town? Um, and we started working with the DEP and some of their analysts. And now uh, they release twice every year uh, EV population data. And uh, so every town can track how many EVs are registered to that town. Um, you see some of that on the right side of the chart. Um, just um, from 2017 to 2022, you see the growth in EVs in Madison. Um, the purple are uh, data and the light blue is a plan that we put together in 2019 um, to try to get to, um, to um, our goal 
which in town is to get 1,200 EVs by 2025. Where do we get the number 1,200 from? Again, we worked with the analysts at DEP and we did uh, basically an extrapolation using certain simple assumptions. Um, if New Jersey gets to 330,000 PEVs, whenever that happens, Madison would have 1,200. So we want that to happen by 2025 to play our part um, in the overall state program. So this is what we've been doing over the last two years. Um, and now let me switch and talk about sort of more current things. Um, so in uh, the beginning of this year, uh, our council voted to adopt a climate action process shown schematically on the right. It's an annual continuous process, which I hope will be followed between now and 2050. Um, and it basically says that for local climate action, every year we will measure how we're doing against some um, adopted goals, measure some climate metrics for the town. We will determine whether we need additional climate actions, incentives, informational programs, or otherwise. Um, and we will then put those adjustments or new actions into effect. And we will go through that cycle every year. And this by itself is not any particular climate action, but it's a governmental process that I like to say makes climate action part of the routine business of your town's government. And that by itself, I think, is a big thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can look at particular things you do for climate, whether they be incentives, informational, installing public chargers. You can look at all those different things. But you have to have a process in your town government for making this stuff continuous. And I like to use the word persistent. Um, and that's what we did. And we're this year in a pilot program. Um, we will make it um, permanent at the end of this year. Um, we have quantitative metrics and goals. Where do we draw them from? We draw them from the state's energy master plan and the 80 by 50 report, which most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and we've synchronized this review process with the town's budget process so that when climate actions have financial implications, we can get those to be considered. Uh, we make recommendations and the town fathers basically you know, decide and adopt them, but we can make our recommendations at the right time so that they can be considered as part of the budget process for the, time, for the town. Um, this year, we also are leveraging the uh, uh, DEP uh, BPU program in community energy planning so that we will create from our climate action program, a community energy plan, uh, which will guide us for the next few years. And uh, we received a grant from the state to support that. And so that came at the right time and it sort of fell into our lap uh, as we were adopting climate action. The basic form of our climate action program, um, following this, uh, this picture on the right, is uh, basically taken from a template document uh, that was published by the uh, North Jersey Sustainable Municipal Alliance. Um, and we can make that available to people um, if, uh, if they're interested in that. Um, we started on a variety of climate actions. And one is we started working with our department heads in town and we um, secured an agreement with them to basically stop buying non-emergency fossil fueled light duty vehicles. And um, this was an interesting discussion and, and negotiation because we looked at the state goal of um, having 25% of the state fleet be electrified by 2025, just two, you know, two years from now, three years from now, um, an ambitious goal. And we said, how does our town do that? We looked at our light duty vehicles um, we said, hey, there's about uh, 36 of them uh, by um, um, 2025. We'd like to have nine of them be electrified. Um, 
if we bought three a year and replaced three cars a year, uh, we would get there. Um, we took that to our department heads and we negotiated on that. And they said, you know, the objective here is not to tell us how many vehicles to buy each year or how many vehicles to throw out each year. The objective is just to stop buying fossil fuel light duty vehicles as the right technology becomes available to take care of your town uh, in electric vehicles, whether it be snow plowing, which is still a challenge for electric vehicles um, and things like that. Um, we'll buy EVs, we'll work with the fossil fuel power, uh, cars we have right now. But so um, it was an interesting discussion to get to this agreement. Um, and that's something that we, we, uh, we got done this year. Um, flipping over to uh, solar energy, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, Madison has a very favorable environment for residential solar um, because of our net metering rate structure. Um, and so we've been doing a lot to make information available to people and to encourage installation of residential solar currently. Again, we track this um, using DEP data. Um, and town data, of course. Uh, currently, a little less than 2% of our 5,000 homes um, have uh, residential solar. It supplies only about 1% of our total energy consumption in town. Our goal by 2050, again, taken from um, our reading of the uh, energy master plan, is that by 2050, we'd like to have 20% of our homes with residential solar. and. Um, um, they would be supplying 6% of our total energy at that time. Um, we, uh, I, I encourage people to investigate the SolSmart program. Um, the um, Sustainable Jersey and uh, I think the state um, are part of the SolSmart program. It's a nationally DOE funded program to make residential solar easier to implement in a town by town basis. Um, they did an assessment of our town, uh, suggested some changes. We made those changes, they were good. Um, and we'll continue to do more in that regard. And we got our bronze certification with, with one year's effort. Um, so that's you know, one thing we did. Uh, another thing uh, that we did was, and this was really not part of climate action, but part of an intelligent uh, utility uh, management was that we completed townwide smart meter installation, uh, which means that all our electric meters in town uh, now have real time communication um, back to uh, a central computer. And uh, I believe there's also a capability for two way communication between those meters. So 99% of the town's 6,000 meters now. Um, are, are the smart meters. And that will enable things uh, that we need to do going forward for clean energy. Um, we are in the process of building three solar carports. Jennifer, I just saw you flash up. Is that a time signal? Um, yeah, we have just a few more minutes. Um, okay, I will, I will get through the material. Um, Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, we're building three solar carports. This is something that I've been very much involved with and I'm very uh, proud to see happening. We're taking three municipal parking lots and we're gonna put solar carports on them. Um, again, just a small part of our total energy, uh, one and a half percent of our total um, Madison's energy budget. Uh, but again, it'll send a strong message and it'll be a good starting point for um, generating more solar energy in town. Um, one thing you have to do as you install large solar facilities is you have to know how your grid will perform um, with these things. If you do this with PSENG or JCPNL, uh, they have their own computer and analytic resources to do this. And uh, local people will probably not even see this being done. Um, your utility will tell you, yay, verily, you can do it, or you can't do it, or we need to uh, update the grid in some fashion. For a small town, it's a bigger deal. Uh, we formed a partnership with uh, New York uh, University, the Power Engineering Lab, and a group there is actually doing a uh, software simulation of our grid. Uh, they show that the grid 
can host plenty of solar power um, on our existing grid without any adverse impact, but you have to do this before you can safely implement uh, large generating facilities. Uh, these are like a half megawatt facilities, each of these at uh, three different locations in town. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, and I'm jumping right now to the future, um, which is um, the home EV charging. Okay. Earlier, I showed you a chart where I was tracking the metrics, current metrics for our EVs in town. It was this small box down here. Let me change my view here on this thing here, there, get rid of that. What you see here is the view to 2025. And you can see just like Doug showed for the whole state in Madison, we have a plan um, to get to our 2,500. There's my cursor, there it is. 20, uh, to our 12, um, for our 1,200 EVs in, um, at the end of 2025. And um, so there's that steep increase that Doug was showing for the whole state. What does that mean? That means that lots of people should be installing home EV charging. Well, if you do some electrical calculations, you'll find that if uh, you and uh, five or six of your neighbors all turn on a level two charger at the same time, um, that might have bad consequences for a local uh, transformer on your grid. So where do the feeders and transformers need upgrades? Uh, how do we try to level our load and make sure that we don't have um, uh, bad peaks in our electrical consumption. Uh, these are some of the concerns uh, that um, accompany one for the grid uh, in the presence of the EV growth. So we're gonna be using the simulation study that we started doing for the purpose of our solar installations that can be used to predict how your grid will respond to changing loads and changing sources. Uh, we'll use that to predict where improvements are needed. Um, the smart meter data that we're getting allows us to see how good the simulation is and validate the simulation. So they work in concert with one another. Uh, we'll do these kinds of simulations every few years and maybe more often as necessary um, to, um, to see uh, how our grid is prepared for EV growth. Um, I just noticed there's an NREL study. NREL publishes a lot of useful papers in this regard, um, but there's one that provides a good review of the analytic tools that are available for doing these kinds of grid studies. Uh, what kind of options do we see going forward uh, to react to this, um, these changing loads on our grid? Uh, basically, I've heard that uh, if, if a home has completely uh, electrified vehicles, uh, their, their electric load could go up by 40 or 50 percent for a household. Um, and, um, you know, we need to know how our grid needs to change to react to that. Um, we're trying the, uh, the persuasive approach by looking at time of use electric rates so that we can, uh, with these electric rates, coach residents to charge their vehicles at night and at the right times. Um, uh, more serious uh, options include uh, incentives to allow um, our smart meter system to communicate with the chargers. And in some places they actually adopt uh, protocols where uh, the towns can uh, do some control of local chargers um, to, to manage the electrical load in town. So this is a serious issue that towns are starting to come up uh, to grips with. And uh, we're just starting to look at our various options. We will probably institute time of use rates sometime in the next uh, um, six months or so. Um, but this is, uh, this is all work, work in progress and under study. And that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, I suspect a lot of this stuff will prompt questions. There's my contact information. And um, Jennifer, um, I'll turn it back to you. <clears throat> and, Thank you. Uh, be Thank ready you, for Peter Q and A Reed. later. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And I want to apologize for getting your name incorrect in the beginning of the the session. Um, it is uh, Peter Freed who's with us from Madison today. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. No problem. No problem. I'll stop and my sharing. I'll stop my sharing.
Wonderful, yeah. thank you. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for this afternoon. We have uh, Yvette uh, Viesus from Community Solar Outreach. She is a manager at Community Solar Outreach. Yvette educates New Jersey communities about the benefits of community solar. She has empowered thousands of New Jersey residents, many of them low to moderate income households, to use New Jersey's community solar program. Yvette, who is bilingual and is also a member of New Jersey's Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, is committed to sustainability and policy efforts to help shape communities and businesses. Thank you, Yvette, for being with us this afternoon, and I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, all right. So it's been great to hear exactly like what Ed uh, Madison is doing um, and it's really exciting stuff um, and community solar is another new program that's very exciting and it's a great opportunity for municipalities um, all over New Jersey and so um, yeah I'm, I'm excited to give this presentation I'll try to be as quick as possible just because we may be a little bit tight on time but solar landscape for those of you who don't know uh, is a commercial solar company and we build huge solar projects like these and recently we've moved over to the community solar field uh, to help empower and power communities uh, around New Jersey with um, lower cost solar energy um, and removing barriers to access to solar. And so uh, we've won a couple of uh, awards uh, in this work uh, and we're excited to keep doing this work in New Jersey, um, our, our home base. We're based in Asbury Park. And so uh, three things that we like focus on uh, is building these projects, doing community outreach in the communities that we serve, like you can see in the second picture, and then um, helping uh, in workforce development and school enrichment programs around New Jersey. And so um, those three things are our bread and butter, and we're, we're excited to do that uh, all over New Jersey. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know what New Jersey's community solar program is, um, it came through uh, the Clean Energy Act of 2018. Um, Governor Murphy basically laid out the goal to get to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And one of the biggest questions that comes up when we have that goal is how do we include communities that can't be a part of solar energy, that can't put that um, panel on their property because they are renters or they live in high rises or they just don't have the right roof or don't want panels on their property. And so for all those reasons and more, uh, the state had to come up with a solution to include these communities um, and prioritize them as we move on to this um, state goal of 100% renewable energy. And so uh, the community solar program was born uh, and the Board of Public Utilities, they, they've laid out a great framework for how uh, developers like Solar Landscape can build these projects in a way that has the community in mind. And so uh, these are a couple of the biggest tenants of the program, uh, reducing electricity costs through uh, discounted solar credits, um, cleaning you know, the, the local community by uh, lowering our reliance on fossil fuels, um, providing everyone access to solar energy, especially those who can't afford um, and uh, who traditionally have been left out of this, um, this process. And then the final part is, again, local workforce development and really investing in the communities that these projects are being located in. And so I'll talk a little bit more about where those projects are, um, but that's an idea of what the goals are for this program. Um, I'll go through a timeline of how community solar has progressed and, and things to look forward to. Uh, so again, in 2018, the Clean Energy Act was approved and it laid out the, the framework for, or laid out an announcement that community solar would be adopted in New Jersey and would be one of those um, states that have a community solar program. Uh, by 2019, uh, we had the first round of applications due. So the, the way that this program works is that um, every year, uh, or the, ideally every year, there will be a, um, a batch of application or a batch of solar projects that will be awarded by the Board of Public Utilities. So that in that first year was pilot year one, uh, there was 75 megawatts uh, worth of community solar projects that were going to be awarded. Um, and by December of that same year, those projects were awarded and they went a little bit over. I think it was like 77 megawatts. Um, and Solar Landscape actually won a, a third of those projects, 20 megawatts um, of community solar in that year one project or year one program. 
And um, by 2021, January 2021, we were able to build the first community solar project that came on the grid. So the first energized project. So this program is, is allowing for real projects to come online quickly and uh, immediately start benefiting the, the communities that they're located in. Um, the year two applications were due in 2021. The program was actually uh, doubled. So it had 150 megawatts uh, capacity for the program. And that just shows how successful the program was initially that uh, it's, it just continues to grow and continues to, to get um, energy behind it. And so there, I, I believe it was like 800 megawatts worth of projects tried to apply in for 150 megawatts worth of allocations. Um, and then the, so it just shows how competitive this, competitive this program is. Um, and then the by 2021, year two projects were awarded, um, and you know, luckily, Solar Landscape uh, still won uh, around a third of the program uh, projects in that program year uh, as well. Um, and the idea is that the program keeps getting more and more competitive, which is good for communities in New Jersey because it's allowing for high yielding projects, projects that are going to benefit uh, the communities that they're in. Um, and we're not going to be okay and complacent with projects that aren't willing to put in the benefits and time and effort in New Jersey communities. Um, by August 1st of 2022, uh, the first year two project was energized. Again, it was a, a solar landscape project in Neptune, New Jersey. And uh, I guess one of the biggest news to, to come out ever in, in the country is the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's what it does to community solar in New Jersey is just allow for stability and a lot more interest. So this program is only going to grow and solar is only going to grow. Um, and just like Doug was mentioning, the way that we benefit from having EVs on the road is by having a grid that is uh, powering those uh, EVs from renewable energy sources. So that's that's how the benefits continue to um, accumulate for, for everything that we're doing. So uh, it's exciting stuff. The Inflation Reduction Act is, um, it has a lot of impacts. And if you guys want to know more about how that impacts community solar and New Jersey, you can let um, send any questions to us uh, during this panel or, or after the fact. Um, and something I did want to just shout out as coming soon and something to look forward to um, is bill consolidation. It's because currently the, the program is, is on a two bill system where you receive your utility uh, bill and you see your solar credits, and then you have to pay for those solar credits from the developer on a separate bill at a discount. But the, the idea is two bills is, um, everyone has, has mentioned to the BPU and to the state, and they recognize that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And uh, luckily uh, the BPU agrees and bill consolidation is coming very soon. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity for um, everyone to bring in comments into this draw proposal for what the permanent program is going to look like. Uh, and we're, we're all looking forward to that. And if you want to be a part of adding comments to that, you can reach out to us and let us know. And we'll give you those comments once um, that's been announced. Uh, or there are a lot of different groups like CCSA that are helping educate communities about uh, the comments that they can put or what what the straw proposal um, says and, and stuff like that. So these things are, aren't are here yet, but they're coming soon and we're, we're very excited. All right, so for those of you who uh, want a better idea of what uh, community solar does and, and what it looks like, uh, basically solar landscape, will go to this building owner and tell them that we want to lease their rooftop to put a solar project to power the grid and power the local community. And so, once we do that, we go to the state and we say we have a community solar project that we want to apply for. We have community involvement. Um, and once the state awards the project, we can build that project. And all of that energy goes straight into the grid. None of it is going to the building at all. So now we have a lot of energy being pushed into the local grid and people in high rises and renters and homeowners in that local community can now choose to opt into that solar farm, that solar project through their utility. So they use their utility account information to um, hop onto that and receive credits from those projects. And um, there's like two main types of boundaries for each project. Um, generally a project will either 
uh, apply to serve the municipality and adjacent municipalities that it's um, that's surrounding uh, that the project or the county that it's located in in adjacent counties. And so there is uh, some level of uh, confusion on that end, but hopefully we're, we're trying to clear things out. Oh, I did want to mention one more thing that, that is coming soon is um, the state is working on a project finder for community solar projects so that communities can easily go to um, a website and put in their zip code and get a lot of information about the projects that are around them, when they're expected to be energized, whether or not they serve them, what the discount levels are. Uh, so that's another big news uh, and the thing that we're looking forward to. Again, the BPU hasn't announced when it'll come out, but we are, we're all looking forward to that. Um, okay, so in general, these projects are going to bring a lot of community benefits. And, and the idea is we're, we're bringing local energy, local sources of energy into these communities so that they can um, be able to access renewable energy without installing panels on their homes. Uh, and without the traditional barriers to access like uh, credit scores, et cetera. Um, we're bringing everyone into this transition with zero emission energy, cleaner air, workforce development, uh, lower energy bills. Um, and a cool thing about this program, at least in New Jersey, um, is that we aren't really impacting greenfields. The, the state is highly incentivizing uh, or prioritizing projects that are located on underutilized spaces like rooftops, parking, canopies, brownfields, landfills, um, and, and stuff like that. So open space and green, green fields, they're, they're being protected in this program. And, and the state is being very holistic in the way that they're approaching how community solar grows. We have a lot of underutilized space. We don't need to get into our greenfield space to, um, make a, a successful community solar program. So we're all uh, very excited about that and its implications. Um, and one of the last things that, uh, and one of the last ways that the community benefits from a, a program like community solar is the impacts that we can have on community engagement. So we're building coalitions of nonprofits and groups to um, educate the communities on renewable energy and um, really see what those you know, what those communities are facing, the, the challenges that they have um, in accessing education around renewable energy. And we wanna be able to meet those needs with resources. Um, here's a, a map showing where our projects are. So this is just one de developer's portfolio of community solar projects. But um, at this point, most of the state is covered by community solar. There are some spots that aren't yet, but. I'm sure by the next year's worth of applications, we'll, we'll make sure to cover the whole state. And this is just very impressive because we, we've we only had a two year program run so far. So uh, again, the opportunities and, and the growth is, is tremendous. Um, so we're all very excited. We started our first year with just eight projects only on PSCNG's uh, grid. And now we're at 54 projects all over PSCNG, ACE and JCPNL. So, um, we're excited to serve these communities, and if you, you know, live in one of these communities, you can easily be a part of this a coalition of, of groups of municipalities that are engaging their communities about uh, community solar. Uh, here's an idea of what community solar partnerships look like. Uh, we, we've partnered with affordable housing providers, uh, environmental community groups, low-income assistance service organizations throughout the states. Uh, throughout the state to make sure that we are really impacting the communities that we're a part of, that we're benef benefiting them. Um, and so uh, a couple of successful partnerships, the most successful partnerships that we've had have been with our municipalities through our green teams, uh, being able to have um, reputation behind a new program uh, is, is very important, especially when we're talking about the the long-term uh, long success of this program, we need communities to feel comfortable. Like this is a program that really is going to change. It sounds like it's too good to be true. Um, when you tell someone that they're gonna be able to go on uh, solar energy without panels on the roof and it's without any additional fees and it's a guaranteed discount every month, it's, it just sounds too good to be true, but the state is really working on making a very valuable program so that it really is too good to be true. And we're just, we're gonna keep growing uh, like that. Um, so 
I guess what, one of the biggest, again, partnerships that we can have um, and, and the most important partnerships is through our municipalities and through our green teams. Um, we've been able, again, to partner with housing um, authorities and, and stuff like that. So um, here's an idea of our community engagement. Sorry, my, my dog just started barking a bunch. Um, there's a, a list, of, a partial list of what community engagement looks like in uh, the solar landscape uh, community groups. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to continue to build out these groups. Um, and these are just some of the early adopters that are supporting uh, local community solar projects and educating their community and getting them onto these projects. They are limited in space and who can subscribe in, in, in terms of numbers. So each project has a certain capacity and it is come, a first come first serve. We do have a 51% um, allotment for low to moderate income communities. So that's another big win for New Jersey and environmental justice in the state. Um, but yeah, the idea is we want these communities to benefit from the, these projects that are currently energizing the grid. Um, and Sustainable Jersey, and there's a couple of groups that are doing a lot of work to help empower municipalities, give them resources about community solar uh, so that they can educate their communities. And one of them is Sustainable Jersey. They have a action that's called Municipally Supported Community Solar. Um, and it's very straightforward. And we've worked with a lot of green teams to help continue to add um, resources to that. They can get, uh, municipalities can get up to 25 points through this one action. Um, and, and we're excited to, to be a part of those teams and those green teams. Um, and then the second part is um, through the Community Energy Plan Grant that came out uh, last year, uh, the BPU is awarding um, through grants and this grant program um, money for municipalities to engage in uh, energy plans. And one of those strategies um, include in increasing clean energy production, reducing energy use emissions, and specifically targeting community solar outreach. So um, again, the state and um, statewide organizations are putting a lot of emphasis on this program. So uh, we just wanna be able to continue uh, that good work and, and continue to educate and work with our municipalities. Um, so for any municipality that wants to get started with um, either, you know, Sustainable Jersey or uh, just doing a community solar outreach plan, uh, you can start by signing a resolution that adds validity to the program uh, to your residents. So letting them know that this program is something that our town wants to be a part of and is excited about. And so we want to support any a community solar project that comes on to, or that can serve our community and ha has these minimum criteria, like a minimum of 20% discount and minimum serving 51% low to moderate income communities, uh, et cetera. And then again, one of the biggest ways that you can do outreach is by having the town send information to their own residents about community solar. So um, I can go on about what community solar is, the impacts and how it works, but uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave some time for, for some question and answers. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can feel free to email me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Yvette. Really appreciate it. I think we have just a couple minutes for a few questions if our panelists are um, up for taking them. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our first question, I think, is for Doug. Uh, does 80% reduction in emissions include the manufacture of the vehicle? I love EVs, but we need more cars off the road through public transport options. Yeah, so this is this is a, a, a great question, and this is starting to kind of get at some of the things I was talking about in the presentation. Um, and so there's really kind of two parts here. One, this the you know the life cycle of production of EVs and, you know, do you actually see those uh, emission reductions? And so I'm not going to go back to the presentation, but there is a slide that literally talks about, um, you know, comparing a gas power car with an EV as part of the production, obviously to produce a car, right? There's, there's, there's an environmental cost. There's a little bit more of a cost with the battery. So that's not to kind of minimize it, but if you're looking at the tailpipe impacts of internal combustion engines, it's just way, way above. Um, now, obviously, with an EV plug into the grid, 
there's a big difference between plugging in in Texas and plugging in California or New Jersey. So we obviously want to be greening the grid, a, a la what Yvette was saying, so that we can make um, the overall emissions be reduced over time for EVs. But really, the, the second thing here, and I, I kind of I included a one line statement on it, but I'm really glad that this is coming up, is that, you know, we can't just say the solution for reducing emissions in our transportation sector is just EVs. And I think we've started to kind of see that play out, um, you know, with the return of car traffic, cars and light trucks. They've come back to the pandemic. People have not gotten back on New Jersey Transit, both bus and rail in the same way. The, the numbers are, are going the right way, but we obviously want to prevent a death spiral for public transit. New Jersey Transit is just so critical to the state. It's so critical for, you know, the literally hundreds of thousands of people that rely on it. And it's also just critical for, for our towns. Um, and we're kind of, you know, because of the federal dollars, we've been in a moment where even though the revenue is way down, the service has not been impacted. And so this is kind of part when we talk about our transportation sector, it's not either or, it's and. We need to fund New Jersey Transit. We need to have dedicated funding. We also need to electrify New Jersey Transit's bus fleet. That's part of a, a broader kind of public health imperative, especially um, in our urban communities. Um, but we need to make sure that we're not cutting back service um, and, uh, and raising fares. And so we are okay right. for the next two years, but then... And fiscal year 26, we will have some real trouble in front of us. So this is why I, I'm not here to talk about New Jersey Transit, but I want to make clear we shouldn't invest in EVs at the expense of public transit op options. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. And uh, Yvette, I see you're in the middle of typing an answer, but I did want to ask this question. Um, what are the benefits, and this might be for Peter as well, what are the benefits to the host business or property owner where the community solar panels are located? Yeah, so there are a lot of benefits. One of the main ones are um, that you get a lease payment for that uh, land that the project is located in. And um, that lease payment is substantial, especially when you realize that you weren't making any money off of your rooftop. Now you can make money. Um, and you can also potentially, if you need a new roof, work into the lease agreement, a, a new roof to support this community solar project. And then in addition to that, you can get accomplish most of your ESG goals as a business by having and being a part of a, a site that or hosting a community solar project that will empower local communities. So it's a, it's a great uh, story all around. And we have a couple of case studies with a couple of our uh, property owners about, about that. Great, thanks. Um, one, one, one important thing also is the price stability that it adds to your power because you have a predictability you will know what this power costs you for the rest of time as opposed to buying power off the commercial grid where we're told it will get more expensive or it's maybe not predictable or whatever so you have this element of predictability whatever you sign up for you can predict the power cost uh, for a long time with almost any kind of a solar installation. Yeah, so that, that would be a, a traditional, you know, PPA or solar installation to power the building. And then community solar would go straight into the grid and they wouldn't necessarily be able to receive the benefits of, of the cost reduction of, of their electricity, but um, potentially they can work that around with their developer and get part of that um, project too. Right, now, I'm, I apologize because when I talk about benefits, our town, our residents, and the electric utility are all the same. So as the cost of our power goes down, it accrues to everyone in town. Um, That's good to know. Well, at that, we are uh, two minutes past time. So I want to thank our speakers today for sharing uh, wonderful information with us. I want to thank um, Julie Groth for helping to organize this panel and Liz Ritter for um, helping with the tech and coordination. I want to invite you all to join us this evening at 7 p.m. as we host our keynote uh, speaker, Mishka Mitchell from em Emerald Cities Collaborative. And we are also giving out the Candace Ashman McKee uh, Legacy Award this evening. So we hope to see you then. And for now, thank you for all the good work you're doing. And thank you for sharing your expertise and your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoyed it.